The Lofton family is extraordinary, and all I can say is it boggles my mind. I think, you know, they would give St. Teresa a run for her money. How many people do that, are willing to give up everything and to, you know, raise five children um, with special needs and to encounter all kinds of uh, discrimination and homophobia and racism. As far as the state of Florida was concerned, gay foster parents were as good of a dumping ground as any. When Bert was um, about 18 months to two years, uh, he zero reverted. He became HIV negative. Now that I don't have HIV, they all try to take me back. When Bert became negative, he became desirable in the state's eye for adoption. So suddenly, they're willing to take Bert away from his brothers, his sisters, everyone that he's come to know as his family. Suddenly, they're going to rip him away from all of this. And the reason? Because gay people cannot adopt in the state of Florida. If the Florida legislators really searched their hearts, there's no way that they can't be a good parent. Are you going to let these kids be raised by loving parents who can take care of them, or are you going to leave them in institutions? Well, look, nobody uh, advocates uh, the institutionalization of children, uh, plain and simple. Uh, children flourish best when they have a mom and a dad. And missing that, you, you have a big void that needs to be filled. What they have done it has been commendable, but they're not going to be adoptive parents. I, of course, I'd love to be a fly on that wall. Understand why I'm not going to prom with a man. I hear about it every day, and I tell them I can't help it, I was born this way. It's not like I ever got to choose. Princess. <coughs> The living with two highly motivated nurses has its advantages and its disadvantages. You know, uh, morning. Morning was uh, Stephen opening the blinds, uh, popping pill bottles, and seeing Roger hovering with an injection all before coffee. Tracy, Let Tracy alone in the bathroom. Your pajamas are on the floor. Put them away. If there's I tissue don't. on the floor, pick them up. Steve and Roger run a tight ship. I don't care whose it is. Pick it up. Put your snake away. Okay? Frank. Here are foster parents who got involved, who took care of those children when others just literally would not step forward to do that. You can sit in your class for a minute this morning. Mm -hmm. And then uh and gave them a family, gave them an environment that was healthy for them, that they could function in, that they could progress in. I didn't look at Tracy's throat the other day, but you did. How was it? It looked a little irritated, but not bad. And to match the advances that were being made in medicine uh, at the same time. Here, Trace. I got one this morning and then a little while, a little later. And therefore gave them the best advantages that they could possibly have. This kind of tough love uh, and the ability to, uh, to understand that and to be consistent in that and have the resolve to really follow through on these things. Did you brush your teeth first? No. This is why we haven't brought you to the orthodontist. And I know you're 15, and every time I ask you if you brushed your teeth, I get no. This is why I'm not going to spend the money on braces. So it just cause cavities. Uh, and that's why they're a very special household, and they're very special people who have a gift. Discipline's important. Children in all ages need to know what's expected of them. And more than that, the continuity. And we try to uh, enforce the same rules consistently with everyone equally. There's no surprises. Anyway, so hurry up. Three or four times already. Well, I'm going to go to school with that fabulous hair fashion just like it is, honey. You've got to remind me three things, okay? Give your eye appointment. We've got to cancel Haven. It's PTA on Tuesday night. It's volunteering at the community pool on Thursday night. It's uh, being completely involved. In fact, Stephen has given up his career, and he is a full-time parent. 
He's involved in school organizations. He's involved in all kinds of extracurricular activities. This is all about the kids. Getting up in the morning, getting everybody through the bathroom, uh, getting off to school with lunch. Uh, five kids is, is a big load. Bert, would you hang up your other jacket? But now just imagine you have five kids and the challenge of HIV. For every dose of meds they miss, Frank. Well, resistance develops. Imagine having the state and even the media Francie is sleeping. evaluating your, your every move. Not only do these kids have to thrive, but they have to thrive under a microscope. You sleep, sleep? They have to stay healthy. They got to stay out of trouble. They've got to perform above average in school. Psychologists, psychiatrists. They got to be well adjusted. They got to be polite. Can you imagine living under that kind of pressure? Oh, I see. How you have to outperform even the best parent in all situations and with all the kids. And all of this under the watchful eye of a bureaucracy that is aggressively looking for any excuse they can to destroy this family just to just yeah. to fulfill their political agenda. Okay. We could appeal to the federal Supreme Court. Well, Florida could appeal to the federal Supreme Court as well. So. When they were in Florida and first got uh, Frankie and Tracy, it just blew me away. And when he told me that he was going to take this baby home from the hospital and take care of it, I just said, do you really know what you're doing? You know, I, I just, I was afraid for him and just, just afraid. Especially under the circumstances that those two were HIV positive. And when we went, took a trip and saw him with the children, and I realized they were doing a fabulous job, <laughs> much better than I could. <laughs> I remember when they brought Frank home. His, his world was the, the size of a county hospital crib. It was three feet, four feet long. And you'd sit him down and unless he fell over, he would be in the same place he left him. And it was Stephen and Roger who would frankly place the bottle just out of reach and motivate him to crawl over and grab the bottle. He would scream, he would cry, but you know, that's the kind of tough love that it really takes to start to broaden a child's world, to, to get him to move, to get him to motivate and start to expand the world that he lives in. As hard as it is to listen to him scream for that bottle, but he'd finally wriggle over and grab it. It was hard to be a part of that, even though I knew in my heart it was the right thing to do. Well, eventually, they motivated Frankie. He started crawling, he started moving, he started walking, and, and I guess pretty soon he's going to be driving. <laughs> I don't think they ever counted on that one, certainly. We decided we that we were going to do it, and we were going to take one child. Three children later, here we are. We had Frankie came to us in August, Tracy in September, and Ginger in April. As I brought her home, Steve was home uh, with the uh, with Tracy and Frank, and I sort of put Ginger in a basket, rang the bell, and left. He did. And I answered the door, and there was a baby on the doorstep. Ginger was absolutely marvelous. She was one of the happiest children that I've ever seen. She was such a joyful child. She sang, she danced, she'd put on little shows, she'd dress up. She was very outgoing. She just seemed to have this beauty in her. Oh, uh, you are dead. Oh my God, look how young you are, guys. I'm so fat. Look how young you are, Raj. Oh, Ginger at school. Oh, she had a lot of congenital problems, a crack addiction, drug addiction, fetal alcohol syndrome. I mean, I can't even count uh, the problems that this poor child had. And uh, she lived in an incubator for a, a long, long time. And when they brought her home, she would go through these crying fits, these crack baby crying fits that would just go on for hours, it seemed like. And one day Roger discovered that if he... Uh, tucked her in and made her a little, a little soft bed and sort of tucked her up against the uh, dishwasher and would run a load of dishes. Um, there was something, maybe it was like the, uh, the incubator. It was warm, it vibrated, made sort of a whooshing sound, but it would kind of calm her right down. So it got to be a joke after a while. Ginger would start getting all cranky and we'd say, well, time to, time to do a load of dishes. <laughs> Once we bit the bullet, it was, you know, what's the difference between one and two? 
and then two and three, and then after three we realized what the difference was. <laughs> <laughs> It was kind of funny. My mom, I called her, and I just said, you know, Mom, I have a baby. And she said, oh, did the dog have puppies again? And I said, no, it's a real one. <laughs> she said, oh, okay, well, what are you doing? <laughs> I told her that I took her home from the hospital and what have you. She said, okay, and she was really unsure, but she just left it at that. So about a week later, I called her back to let her know that the child was black, which was a little surprise for her. So then another week went by, and then I told her that the baby had AIDS. <laughs> At that point, she just said, uh, well, are there any more? Anything else you want to tell me? I said, no, I think, I think I've broken it in nicely. Uh, however, about a week later, she sent me a check like for $100 to buy something for the children. And since then, they've come down. They've asked a lot of questions, but uh, they're part of the family. Then Bert came along, and Bert they got, I believe they got him at birth. Oh, Bert. Bert's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bert came when he was 15, no, nine weeks old. Mm -hmm. Nine weeks old. Uh, he was a surprise. I have been with Steven Roger for uh, ever since I was born, actually. I was born in the hospital, and my dad just picked me up and took me home. Steven had gone to the hospital with the social worker, and um, uh, I had no idea Bert was coming home. I came home from work, and there he was. At that particular private children's hospital, he was so unwanted, they just handed him over and said, take him out of here. We weren't adopted, but they just they just took us. He on the yeah. road as a result of communication from afar. Yeah, and, you and they come to get you, Bert. Yeah, and you said I'm a Libra too. No, no, I said Tracy was a Libra. Which isn't to romanticize. I mean, it's not like I've never seen a gay parent um, have a temper tantrum or get fed up. Hey, Dad, why did you pick up my clothes? Okay, get your watch. Ernie, you don't have socks on. I don't think so. Get them on now. Um, Wayne, please go back in the kitchen and finish your reading. No, go back in the kitchen and finish your reading. I think we want to be careful not to imagine that the, that it's all that different. The stains on the sleeves, Tracy, it looks hideous. Every morning starts with a fashion fight. Um, <laughs> we wear a scarf. Will you wear a scarf? No, I'm not wearing a scarf. Fine. Tracy here says, you will be yelled at while eating breakfast this morning. And then you will go to school and do something that you're not supposed to. Well, my parents sometimes get too strict. I guess it's because my for my health. Then why are these on the floor? That's okay because I know I'm doing something wrong. So you left them on the floor for three days since I got home. Because yeah. you're gonna put them on today. They've been there for three days, Tracy, since Tuesday night when I got home. Ah uh, no. Yeah. I don't like all parents yeah. except different parents, different like different species, kind of. Yeah, I yeah. took him down. No, you didn't. Okay, accept it. It was there when I came home. Like a different tribe or something. When are you gonna stop picking my clothes? Pardon? I said, when are you gonna stop picking my clothes? Uh, when you can start putting them together appropriately, Tracy, and when I can trust you to go to I school do. without putting on your friend's clothes and throwing your clothes in the bottom of their lockers, Tracy. That's when I'll stop, okay? We had this discussion about what to go with Roger. Well, you haven't stopped long enough, Tracy, okay? And when I'm out of town, you wear the same outfits every day. You put dirty clothes back in your closet, so I'll keep doing it until you get out of these I habits. I never put dirty clothes. I went downstairs to put them. The pink jacket was filthy. Well, I didn't know it was filthy. Tracy, you wore it and hung it up. Don't you need to know it was filthy. I didn't know, Dad. I don't look at my jackets. Well, maybe you should start looking at your jackets. Here's what it says to Steven. You may feel chained to a household responsibility, left out in the cold. Come on, Tracy. It's not like it's all that different. We're late. What's different is that they're doing it in a fishbowl and under a microscope, and so they're, I think, only the extraordinary ones are willing to dare. Come on. Uh, where did Ernie go? He went with Steve and Roger, you know, two adults, good jobs, good income. It's, it's the 80s, it's Miami. Uh, South Beach is starting to really rock. 
Why did they take their club card and turn it into a WIC card? So we talked about it, we discussed it, we looked at finances, because it was giving up a lot as far as a single lifestyle. But overall, we did have the same compassion for the children. All I can surmise is that it really is innate to who they are as people, knowing them as I do. It's just inexplicable to me that anyone has the capacity. I mean, I'm in awe that anyone could take on the kinds of children that they did and seem to do it with the amount of dedication, skill, and just humor that I've seen in the situation. And part of it was sort of a screw you uh, as well, um, frankly. There was a slight attitude there about uh, showing the rest of the world uh, what to do. Stephen met Roger when he was going to nursing school, and Roger was going to... That was in, um, uh, in the early 80s. I moved to Fort Lauderdale, and they decided to move out here. We had to face the fact that healthcare professionals themselves would not take care of patients that had HIV. They both eventually ended up in the Jackson Memorial Hospital in the 80s, where they both worked in the pediatric AIDS department. I met Stephen over 30 years ago in high school. We became instant friends, and we've been friends ever since. In 1985, the year Rock Hudson died, the first AIDS test was available, and it confirmed my worst fears. So based on everything I knew at the time, I packed up my life, I moved back to Los Angeles to die and realizing that in the beginning AIDS was a fatal disease. Someone described it very succinctly to me once. It's like, uh, it's like living with a time bomb and you hear it ticking and when they're well it ticks very low and if anything is happening you hear it ticking louder and louder and louder and that's, that's what it's like. I found myself fighting two fights, the fight against AIDS and the fight against the healthcare system. The whole healthcare system, the public health prevention network, was not prepared for this epidemic at all. I found myself at the mercy of social workers who would scrape my paperwork across the table with an index card so they wouldn't have to touch it. We also had to deal with the utter panic and fear that was occurring. Right or wrong, I can't help but feeling that this disease came along that was killing gay people and prostitutes and marginalized uh, people. This was not white Anglo-Saxon American getting affected. This was a bunch of homosexuals. That was almost a dream come true for the big, fat, rich white guys uh, running Washington. We were more than willing to make all these people expendable if they were gay, or if they were black, or if they were drug users, or if they were anybody that society didn't like. And it really took on almost political overtones that you know, were not really appropriate to identify what was going on. I was homeless, I was broke, I was sick. And for the patient, in the end, the patient suffered the most for this. It was really Steve and Roger um, who made uh, an incredible effort to get me the kind of medical attention that I needed to survive, to live. Uh, and they extended an offer for me to come live with them, and, uh, and I did. And so I guess in some way uh, you could call me the, the Lofton Croto proto-child. We began to see prostitutes, those that went out to get drugs and brought in the whole issue of mothers that were infected with HIV and having children. We worked very hard to take care of those mothers and doing the best we could. In the beginning, AIDS was a fatal disease and therefore the number of patients we saw eventually died of that, including the mothers. And therefore, we now had to deal with children that didn't have parents. Here are two pediatric AIDS nurses, specialists, who are taking in black babies with AIDS, children that nobody wanted. And as far as the state of Florida was concerned, gay foster parents were as good of a dumping ground as any. How many people are willing to give up everything and to you know, raise five children um, with special needs. Our goal is to have the kids stay with us and, and provide them with a quality home life regardless. Most children with AIDS are going to die when we don't know. Typically then, most children didn't live beyond two years. And to um, encounter all kinds of uh, discrimination and, and um, uh, homophobia and racism. 
It was uh, really interesting being in the South. Florida is very much the South. The revolution of consciousness where gay was a household word and every household was divided from the White House on down, that happened here, right in the little old deep South. Especially when you're obviously a gay man strapped to a black baby walking through the, the supermarket or the shopping mall. And this is the same community that supported George Wallace, that went to Gene McCarthy, that threw out Anita Bryant with our help. So those early years uh, was, was a lot of fun because there was Stephen, there was Roger, and there was I, and there was Frankie, Tracy, and Ginger. So everybody had a black baby strapped to them. We'd go out, um, which leaving the house, as any parent knows, is, is a lot of work, especially when you have uh, IVs involved and and uh, pills to do and we had to grease Frankie up from head to toe for his uh, skin issues that he had when he was a child so leaving the house had its challenges. We'd walk around to the back of the car and pop the hatchback and there would be a bunch of kids strapped in uh, big grins on their face and so happy to be out and having a good time and then only to be confronted by some uh, very negative person saying where did you get those kids? Oh, well, we got some looks. <laughs> Uh, there was a lot of blatant questions, people coming right up, you know, what's going on. Who are you? Where's their mother? That was the, the big comment. Where's their mother? Um, and a lot of the questions I didn't feel like really needed to answer. And uh, Stephen would turn around and say, well, she was a crack whore and she's dead. And that would usually shut them up right there. I remember one day specifically, uh, Stephen had WIC, which is the Women, Infants, and Children's Program for uh, Nutrition. It was kind of like food stamps, but not really. And we went to the store, and there we were holding these little black babies standing in line. And Stephen places a jar of caviar in front of the, the uh, checker at Piggly Wiggly in, uh, in Miami. And uh, he hands the checker the food coupon, the WIC coupon for eggs. And she says, well, you can't buy caviar with this. This is Wick. And he said, well, read the coupon. It says, eggs, any kind. And she just, I mean, that was it. She just went blank. But that was the kind of attitude Stephen had about the whole thing. It was so ridiculous to him that these hoops, you had to jump through all these hoops. And the, the actual welfare of the children was, was never really the focal point of any of these programs. The child welfare system is a political institution uh, responding to the whims many times of uh, elected officials. So now we have Bert, who uh, suddenly zero reverts. I used to have HIV, but I only had bits, bits of it, so then it went away. When they test for AIDS, they really don't test for the virus. They test for the antibody to the virus. Everybody thought he was HIV positive. In fact, he was technically HIV positive for the antibody. He just didn't possess the virus. When Bert became negative, he became desirable in the state's eye for adoption. Now that I don't have HIV, they all um, try to take me back. That's where I got confused. So now the state of Florida is faced with a situation. Now they have a, uh, a healthy child, suddenly, uh, and that healthy child is uh, technically adoptable not to, to gay people, not to second-class citizens, but real people who might actually want a real child. Uh, it's illegal to, um, to adopt kid, kids with, uh, if you're gay. When this all came to light, Stephen and Roger filled out an adoption form, and there was a particular uh, line on the form asking about uh, sexuality. They didn't lie, they left it blank. When we became foster parents, I filled out a stack of forms and had my fingers printed and blood tests and health exams, and everything was fine, and I was fit to be a foster parent. But when I came around to adopting a child who had already been in our home for three years, I was unqualified because I'm gay. Homosexual couples do not provide the kind of stable, wholesome environment that would justify the state having a law that allows them to adopt children. Mm -hmm. Correct. Night, boys. A stable environment is important. Stephen and I have been together for 18 years. I don't know uh, that many couples that have been together that long. What they have done has been commendable, but they're not going to be adoptive parents. 
I, I'm speechless. I, it, it, I, I can't understand how uh, a couple interested in adopting children who are in need of a permanent family, who have indeed been living with them since infancy, can be denied from adopting solely uh, on the basis of the sexual orientation of the prospective parents. I think he probably should be taken away and given to, hopefully, a mother and father who are married and made part of that kind of a family. It is clearly not the case that there is any advantage that Bert could ever get. And the fact that he lives under the threat of this is clearly destructive. With the best of intentions, people who agree with me will take the child away. He'll be placed in a good home and decide to rebel and say, hell with everybody, I wanted to go back. On the other hand, he may, it may work out well and he may turn into a fairly normal kid. Uh, children flourish best when they have a mom and a dad. This case isn't about whether it would be better to have gay parents or whether it would be better to have heterosexual married couples as parents. This case is about are you going to let these kids be raised by loving parents who can take care of them or are you going to leave them in institutions? If they really care for the child, they should also realize that while everybody wants to be validated, and I'm sure they do, still, this guy, this, this boy, is not going to understand both sides of the world, the straight world, so to speak, unless he gets to live in it a while. It's okay to keep these kids for what is now 17 years of their life, but it's not okay to adopt. We shouldn't allow our gratitude toward, in this case, these two homosexuals, who I presume have done a decent job of raising the kid and so forth, to overwhelm our obligation to the child to give him a, a look at both sides of the coin. It's, it's sickening to understand that you would rip a child away from everything they know because of religious-based hate. And that's exactly what it is. It's religious-based hate. It's wrong in our judgment to adopt a policy that would intentionally deprive children of both a mother and a father. I, um... I'm, I just feel those kids are really, really fortunate to have them as parents. They do so much with them, give them every chance there is. And the homosexuals should be thanked for doing what they did. And obviously, more than just homosexuals, they, they've done some good for this kid, whatever. I'm a lucky guy. So the case with Bert was so cut and dried. I mean, the hypocrisy is so obvious. The circumstances are so obvious that I'm sure it's one reason why the ACLU decided to take it on. I have a crisis where we have this uh, Aurelia Wilson, a little baby that disappeared in our state uh, through the Department of Children in, uh, in Florida. And this DCF group has lost over 3,000 kids. Even though they have a $300 million computer scene, they've lost 3,000 children they don't know exist. I can't understand how the state of Florida, with their record on child services, can for one minute think they can compare their record of success with children to this family's success. The bottom line is, what's wrong with America? That we're more than willing to watch kids dead rather than to see them in the arms of loving gays. Uh, quite clearly, those who engage in homosexuality ought to be among the very last choices. That's the level of concern about child welfare that the state of Florida had about these children's welfare. If you allow gays to adopt, you would reduce the caseload of 40,000 kids that are abused and sitting in the system with a multi-billion dollar price tag that goes along with it. Just nice to go to the pants, get some socks on Okay. You look handsome. So you're looking at an institutional crisis that DCF is part of. Uh, government endorsed, which is the fact that we're all expendable and nobody is accountable. And so and it's only a question of who screams the loudest. You think that it's DCF that doesn't want to just talk to you? They won't talk to the media. They don't want to talk to any of the politicians. They don't want to be accountable to address an answer. It, it takes a very special uh, type of family. Uh, with Stephen and Roger, of course, they have to, they have to be sure that the, the kids are properly taken care of. Frank, want to take a toast, please? They, the kids get the pills they have to take. In fact, I have seen Roger uh, on the, on the uh, uh, kitchen table 
line up the pills for these for these five kids and it's absolutely incredible each child has a different set of pills if a child does not take a pill that is like that is murder this this was my family too family today is composed of of, of a mother a father and children having grandparents um, aunts and uncles and cousins, that's what makes up a family. They mean the um, male breadwinner, female homemaker, the Ozzy and Harriet family, um, which was kind of enshrined, I think, in popular consciousness in the 1950s. I've come to believe that it isn't only because of how widespread that family form was then, but I really think TV had a lot to do with it. I think, you know, that was the first decade in which there was a mass audience for television. And the uh, domestic sitcoms of that period, there were just so many, I grew up with them. Um, things like I Remember Mama, Ozzie and Harriet, Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best. There were just a slew of these programs that kind of celebrated the modern nuclear family with the wise male breadwinner and the female homemaker and their 2.3 kids and Spot and Puff and the White Picket Fence. And I think that has played a very a disproportionate role in the American psyche ever since. Um, that family system, however, was a bit of a historical aberration. If you look at family life historically and cross-culturally, that particular family form represents a very small part of history. And it was only possible under certain economic conditions. It depended on um, the male family wage during industrial society. Our society, mankind, has always blessed that union and blessed that practice. And one of the blessings upon it is marriage, marriage between a man and a woman. Of course, it's a form of family life that was only for white Americans, not for black Americans. Um, slaves weren't allowed to marry. Their families were disrupted through sale, etc. They often, couples couldn't live together. It required a certain economic base to have that kind of a family system. For many years in this country, unbelievably, all three branches of government were able to agree that blacks and women should not have the right to vote and were not equal citizens in this country. It was not until 1920 that women in all states of the Union could vote. Now imagine that. All three branches of government read the same Constitution, they read the same Bill of Rights, and they somehow agreed that these individuals were less than other individuals with less rights. Where's this one? The one that, let me see that one. Uh, just a second, turn around. Is that dirty? Well, actually it's been dirty. Let me see your days, the last two days. Okay, hang it back up. Where's this one, it's raining. Man's made a lot of stupid mistakes over time, and they've corrected them. Ernie, think you left the toilet unflushed to go deal with that? Nobody's perfect, and, and no government is perfect. How can we, as historically in this country, uh, look at the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and then turn around and say one group, let's define one group of American citizens and let's deny them, let's not give them the same rights as every other citizen in this country. How can that be? Those were changes that were rightfully made, giving women the right to vote, giving blacks the rights and that they deserve, or any minority for that matter, that they deserve. Um, because you're talking about you're talking about uh, characteristics that are definitely natural and of nature, and you're talking about people. If you're a dedicated communist, you have to eat, live, and breathe philosophy. If you're a dedicated gay, uh, you get sex. I, I won't go on, off the premise that you, that you can compare one's sexuality other than uh, heterosexuality um, to, to, to one's race or one's sex. Um, for the simple fact that two men together or two women together cannot procreate. The child is brought into the world in a normal manner. Just like, like the, 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 the blessed natural union of a man and a woman. Whereas statistically in the 1950s, the um, majority of families that included children were male breadwinner, female homemaker, nuclear families. By the 1970s, that wasn't true at all. To change that whole dynamic, 
you opened up a Pandora's box. And you now had two earner families, you had step families, you had single parent families, um, and you had a huge diversity of different kinds of family types. And embedded in that, but barely visible yet, was the beginning of gay and lesbian people choosing to be parents outside of heterosexual marriage. Everybody needs the, the upbringing, the, the, the benefits of having... They need to have a mom and a dad role model and they need to have that kind of permanent relationship that the same-sex couples do not give them. And missing that, you, you have a big void that needs to be filled. There is no research whatsoever to support this view. It's an issue of indoctrination as far as I see it. Uh, clearly it's spread through actual seduction or molestation, especially of boys, it's often uh, rather contagious in that respect. The notion that gay men uh, are essentially wanting to adopt children because they want to increase the number of homosexuals in gay men is just ludicrous. Gay men and lesbians want to adopt for the same reasons that heterosexual individuals and couples want to adopt. They want to provide a loving, caring, permanent, legal families to children badly in need of them, and they want to start families of their own. Gay parents are no more successful in converting their children to any form of sexuality than heterosexual parents are. Dick Cheney, didn't work for him, he's got a gay daughter. Didn't work for Pete Knight or Phyllis Schlafly, they all have gay kids. So how do you make your kid gay? Well, you can't. It's not a choice. Didn't work for them, and it's not going to work for gay parents either. Kids are going to be who they are and what they are. It's not a choice that parents can make. Anything can happen right now with respect to, you know, homosexual couples being allowed to adopt children, sure. Fred, get out of the closet. But... Okay, it's the 90s, but, 2000s, whatever, come on. But... Okay. Out of the room while he's in there. He's going to use a focus on it, okay? Come on, man. Wait, I'm waiting. let's get this paper picked up on the floor, please. Leave him alone in the morning, okay? Sure. Okay, did you brush your teeth? Oops. Do it now, okay. You might have more effeminate men who are gay who wanting to put their gay son in ballet classes. So, you a parent who is worried about a boy dressing up and going to ballet class probably has some insecurities about his own sexual orientation. Taking ballet is awesome because there's girls everywhere. You're like the only boy there's like girls surrounding you. It's like they're all jumping in the air like deers in front of you. Ah, that's a pretty sight. You know, uh, or uh, lesbian women who want to put their adopted daughter into real rugged, um, uh, uh, boyish type uh, sports. There are many mothers, I was one of them, who pushed their son to be more physically active and daring than his, his father did. If you go to, you know, kind of any playground, you can see dad urging the child on to great exploits. Mom saying, well, be a little more careful there. I was the one who taught him to walk home and cross the street from the bus stop when my husband was worried that it might, might not be safe. I mean, there is a huge array of gender variation here, and it's kind of silly to imagine that there are just two stripes or brands of behavior. Male and male is not the way God intended. And for you lesbians, don't think we discriminate against you. Look, there's no power. So long to the days of tab A can only be inserted into slot B. Today, it's, it's basically they want full-blown marriage. They want full-blown adoption of children, they, 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 have, they want all the benefits that, that they can get. And so basically it's like, where is the agenda gonna stop? What I say to the heterosexual radical right fundamentalists that are trying to stop us from gay adoption is weed your own backyard. Don't look at us, look at what you're doing wrong in your lives and try to correct it. They do this all under the guise of sexual orientation. It's my sexual orientation. That, uh, uh, that, that I, is the new civil right that they see. And they've used the civil rights uh, uh, legislation of the 60s to justify their lifestyle and get it uh, uh, cemented into law. And I will say that the, the, freedom, the freedom buses of the 60s that carry blacks to civil rights has been hijacked by the radical gay community to favor their out of step, out of mainstream agenda. Um, what you have now today is you basically got homosexuality run amok. That's terrific. That is 
so great. So nice cars. <laughs> this is fun. Let's put the shades down. <laughs> Alpha, Alpha, Chris, Chris. Alpha, Alpha, Chris, Chris. Alpha, Alpha, Chris, Chris. Wait, keep going, just please come on. Alpha, Alpha. They want a picture of your face. We're working on Florida. Yes, and we are working on okay. it. Okay. We're gonna win too. Keep the dykes put bikes away, away from, from the horses. horses. <laughs> that's that's what we heard them yell. Well, they're gonna come by here. This is the parade round. <laughs> dykes on bikes away from the horses. <laughs> but back up. That's such a lie. No, but it looked cushy. <laughs> Alpha, Alpha, Chris, Chris. 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 Alpha, to, uh, to see Stephen and Roger. And when I saw the children and the sadness of these kids, it, um, well, it was wrecking. Tracy had, uh, she had 12 hospitalizations before we took her home. She wasn't rolling over in the crib. She wasn't sitting up. Uh, she had a severe sinus problem. Get rid of that booger. So we had to suction her for almost two years straight, three or four times a night, just so she could breathe. Typically then, most children didn't live beyond two years. I kind of felt like one of the kids uh, in a lot of ways. I felt like it was a family, and uh, very much so. And it's what sort of motivated me to take some photographs and do some home movies and go on the picnics and spend Christmas and do dress up and, and all the kinds of things that families do. I would bring along my video camera. Uh, try and capture some of this because I, I frankly didn't believe these kids were going to be around very much longer. In fact, I didn't believe I was going to be around very much longer. It just seemed uh, like a good idea to try and capture some of this because, frankly, most people really don't understand what is really involved. Incredible, isn't it? How difficult it really is to keep a family like that together and to keep a sense of positive thinking. A belief system that things were possible, that there was a future. These kids were not warehoused. They were not sitting there waiting to die. They were endowed with everything a child has to grow and develop and thrive. And indeed they did. I would take my camera and I would try and shoot as much as I can, even this one event with Sophia Loren. Sophia Loren was an exceedingly gracious woman. She came to our research facility. She wanted to understand what we were dealing with, how she could get the message out there and pass that message on. And in doing that, she really wanted to see and get involved with patients and show that she was not afraid to do that. Back in those days, um, it was still kind of scary. And the idea that Sophia Loren would even touch an AIDS baby was, was pretty incredible. That's how we met Frankie, who was a young baby, and the media was there. And we used that to express to the community what we were facing, what we needed to do. Here was this gorgeous baby. He's a beautiful boy. He looks wonderful. He really looks wonderful. We have a bottle? I hope he goes to college. And I guess my big question in seeing all of that is what happened to Frankie? Here? Mm. To see this 15 years later is utterly remarkable. I mean, here is now a strapping, healthy teenager. And I think what it, what it does, at least for, for me as an investigator, puts into perspective 20 years of struggling and putting together something that really made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Smells like so good. Well, they're tuning for a four-string bass. Is E A B G, as shown right here. Uh, I would like to play a five because I just love the beat sound of the uh, bass. What would I say to Frank today? I I'm going to approach it from a personal point of view, and I would say thank you. 
when I look back to that day, you know, literally for me, with my involvement in all of this, um, it was the first time that I really sat down with a child with HIV infection, fed them a bottle in the setting that it was in, represented everything we were at that point in time. So I would say thank you. In retrospect, I feel very honored to have been able to do that. And also thank you because I don't think he realized what it did for all of us. It literally gave us a boost in courage. And what that event did in the long run because it built literally the facility that we're in now, an entire new AIDS research unit. And if, if I met him personally, you know, if he wouldn't mind, I'd probably grab him and give him a big hug. <laughs> and again, say thank you. That's pretty fun for me. It's fun, I just get scared. <laughs> They put their heads together during the movie. No, you didn't. Baby in the Baby in the Little baby in the bathtub Getting all your trouble Trouble Little baby, I'm thinking maybe It's been too long, you've been wearing that gravy And though you may not want to get more scrap and fire tata We're gonna make a squeaky clean top And uh, I remember one picture that they have It showed uh, Ginger pushing little Bert in a uh, perambulator down Ocean Avenue in, in Miami Beach. And I said to Roger, I said, Roger, I said, here's, here's Ginger, and she's graduating from, from preschool. I said, I think that's wonderful. So then Roger said to me, and I'll never forget it, he said, this will probably be the only graduation that Ginger will ever have. And it turned out to be right. Ginger went downhill and she passed away. It was horrible to lose a child, but at least she was able to die at home with us and not in some strange hospital room. It was very hard when Ginger died. It was very tragic and very sad. And it was very real from what we had experienced prior. I think it was a reality check for Frankie and Tracy to understand that, you know, if it happened to Ginger, was it gonna happen to them? That's a lot to deal with when you're six or seven years old. Uh, Ginger was in an urn, and uh, uh, Tracy and the boys would point to, to the urn and say, uh, Ginger's in there, Ginger's in there. And Stephen and Roger, although they provided health care and medical care, they also provided love and support and guidance and the intangibles that don't have to do with pills to try and make these children um, healthy and happy. And that speaks so highly of who they are as a person and why these children have become such great kids and so happy. So for any parent, you can imagine what it's like losing a child. It's truly earth shattering. Even if it's a, a foster child, even if it's a little black baby with AIDS that nobody wanted. When you live with kids, when you get to know them, when they become part of your heart and part of your family, losing a child is devastating. To even bring home a new baby with the knowledge that in a year or two, they're going to be another casualty of AIDS and that you're going to live with this child and eat with this child and laugh with this child only to lose this child in a tragic way is devastating. Can you imagine what it takes to enter into this kind of a relationship over and over and over? We really didn't think there was much of a future. We had no med we had very little medicine for the kids, and uh, uh, most of the children their age died. And that was the expert opinion. That alone is just mind-boggling. 
But on the other hand, I don't think Stephen and Roger ever envisioned that these kids would grow up and they would have to have the talk about sex. They would have to uh, get them a, a driving test and, and give them the car keys. I don't think they ever stopped to consider this was a reality and this is the reality they're facing now. It's a whole different reality. Thank God. Thank God. It's a different reality. I like the pills. Oh, where's the porn? Where's the porn though? Oh, I think this is the porn. You can put your pills in here. You could. These are absolutely I was in Florida the last 10 days. You know, I was obligated with court and then the attorneys and the meetings and it's on and on and on. It never ends. So given Stephen's propensity for a good fight, you'd think that with the ACLU behind him that he would have championed this cause. That simply wasn't the case. They went to the state of Florida with their attorneys and they tried to cut a deal because they felt it was in the best interest of the children not to make a circus out of this family. And they said, look, uh, keep your stupid law. Why don't you transfer the venue of the children from Florida to Oregon? We'll move there. That's where his parents were, the grandparents. The state said okay. So when the school year was up, they sold their house and they went to Portland. So there they were in Oregon with children who were a ward of the state of Florida. And uh, health care is uh, administered on a state level. So Medicaid in Florida doesn't necessarily pay for drugs in the state of Oregon. As soon as they got there, however, the state of Florida reneged on the deal. Deal? What deal? So they found themselves now with three children and no health care. That was a huge challenge. So after being forced to submit mountains of paperwork, Florida reneges on the deal and takes away the kids' health care. So Steve and Roger had to go to the lawyers, and after the threats and the legal wrangling, Florida finally gave in. The kids had their health care back. Meanwhile, Oregon had heard about this family and what they'd done to turn these hard-to-place children in Florida into the great kids they are now. <laughs> well, the raspberry and the blackberries aren't ripe right now. Well. Oregon had these two little HIV-positive toddlers with a history of severe neglect and abuse. Well, what they do is they lose their leaves so that you can't hardly notice. Oregon begged Stephen and Roger to take Wayne and Ernie. That long, skinny one over there. No, you've got cold in your eye, or anything? Uh, yeah, he does. Uh -huh. He's got some, you see how his eyes are greasy? Yeah. He's got an antibiotic ointment in the rest oh. of the eyelid. So we'll have corned beef and cabbage for dinner. Seriously? Wayne and Ernie had been assigned to several homes with disastrous consequences. The cows are turning Oh my goodness, that sure is. That is. Stephen and Roger accepted, but they had to run it by Frank, Tracy, and Bert first. Watch out, come on. It was unanimous. Wayne and Ernie became part of the family. Ernie! What did I ask you? It really helps having older children as a role model. And these kids were a great role model. Came home and the first thing out of Frank's mouth was, Dad, they're white. The configuration of the family had always been white dads and black kids. I forgot to tell them, I mean, just, <laughs> we never even thought of it, you know. Stephen and Roger, being colorblind, never even thought of warning Frank and the others that these kids were going to be white. How do you tell if it's a girl? Well, how do you tell a boy from a girl? From no. 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 How do you tell a boy from a girl? Okay, well, when you figure that out, let us know. Well, let's see. Do boys have titties? No. Big ones? Yeah. Big ones? No. Okay, that's that's one way. Yeah. Uh, you're too much. You are. It's really kind of a kind of a international group he's got there when you think of all the different races that they are. Get me. Yeah, sure. I'm gonna take this across the street. The uh, I think they've already fed the chickens. I don't think you want to bring any more of it. But you can ask Grandma, they're right outside. Say, if he beats all of us. 
It's just really good. Uh, doesn't bother me at all. Out there, all the different nationalities. I mean, what's the color of your skin? It's what's inside. Recently, uh, the kids uh, went on a cruise. And I was very happy to see this venue, this cruise for uh, gay families. I'm really glad I, I was part of that. On the cruise, they were confronted with uh, a bunch of Baptist protesters uh, in the Bahamas. It was really sad to see these people screaming, telling us we were going to hell, and you know, it really scared the kids. It's a touchy time in their life, especially Bert, you know, being 13. Uh, here he is with uh, gay dads on one side, and on the other side of this fence are a bunch of black uh, Baptists from the Bahamas uh, screaming that they're all going to hell. Get out of our country. We do not approve with, of the gays that are that's, here that's right, that's right. and the gays that come in from abroad. I'm totally against gays adopting children. What are, what are you it's hard enough at that age without that kind of level of hatred and confusion in his life. If you have been a victim of AIDS and had you not have a gay affair, you probably would not be dying of AIDS right now. Back there, I thought was um, weird. Weird. It's a cool place to be at, but not with all the uh, yelling and just crap. You know, you're kind of caught between between worlds. You know, as a gay person, there's sort of a non-children's world that one lives in. I'm really, really glad that uh, Rosie invited Stephen and Roger and their extended family and picked up the tab and I think it's a, an important moment for these uh, families that are sort of caught in between. They're not leading a gay lifestyle and they're not a straight family. And Sometimes it's hard to find a venue for being gay with kids. Uh, which world do you live in? So the idea of, uh, of this maiden voyage and the, uh, the concept in general, to go on board and express one's affection and be a family and live out as a family uh, in a community of other families. So it's interesting to see the, the Falwells and the, and the Pat Robertsons of the world uh, see the, one, the orange there? Uh, point at something like 9-11 and blame that on gay people and abortionists. Even though it was one theocracy, attacking another theocracy. Uh, and both looking at gay people as the causality for a lot of this. Look at the Statue of Liberty! Gay people seem to be at the bottom of the ladder. It's the catch-all for everybody's hate, for every problem. Are we actually going to start believing 
not just the words of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but the intent of those documents. Was the intent of those documents to say that it's okay to single out certain people? That we can uh, have a constitutional amendment against gay marriage? That it's okay to, to narrowly define one group of people and isolate them from the same benefits and experiences and rights that every other American has? Well, it didn't work in the Middle East. It hasn't worked in those societies, and I would probably bet it's not going to work in this country either. There is no basis for any kind of opposition to gay and lesbian lives or parenthood other than religious or ideological opposition. Of course, the gay community is going to use anything they can to grab at, to try to add weight to their cause, when, when the reality is they have no uh, no water in their buckets. They have no buckets to carry. There's nothing for there's there's nothing be there's no wind behind their sails. There is no reason to believe that there is damage to children, other than the social damage of stigma that um, has to do with social disapproval, as opposed to anything in the parenting itself. But as a Hispanic himself, it's very insulting for someone to say, I am gay and I deserve the same rights as a Mexican, I deserve the same rights as a black. Excuse me, these, it, it's, it's like saying that the struggles of the, of the Jews in the Nazi concentration camps is just as deserving as, hey, I have the right to sleep with whoever I want. It's my sexuality, but I should get the same benefits, by golly, as the poor Jews who were discriminated against, as the blacks who were beaten in the 60s. It's an insult and it should stop. I wonder how many evangelicals have taken in one, let alone five, HIV positive children. Yeah, well, I would have no problem taking in a, a child, a foster child, as long as I had the financial means to do so. You know, if I don't have it within my means, I wouldn't take a child in because it, I would be, I'd be doing them a disservice. Recently, over 100,000 evangelicals marched on Washington against gay marriage, which to some people may seem like a tangential issue. But in reality, if just one out of a hundred of those families took in a special needs child, we would not be having this conversation right now. I don't buy the argument that there are not enough parents for the number of kids that are in foster care or that are, are just waiting to be put in a home. I think there are plenty of them. The, the pool of prospective adoptive parents simply isn't large enough. Every month, the state of Florida sends them a letter saying that they are actively looking for an, an appropriate family to take Bird away. They're just cruel letters telling us that they're going to look actively for another home for him. Jeb Bush just applauded the 11th Circuit Court's decision to uphold Florida's ban on gay adoption. Your ass is too fat. Meanwhile, he presides over one of the most notoriously corrupt childcare systems in the country. It shows where his priorities are. Uh, uh, we'll go. We have to do that in the morning. Good night, Good night. Oh, I can't believe that's $230. I can't believe it either. I'm going to borrow some money from you. Lift your head up. <laughs> oh, sweetheart. Kissy, kissy. Good night, boys. Good night. Good night. Goodbye. I love you. Love you, too. Three down, two to go. Further ahead, I can predict... Good night, brother. With 100% certainty that gay people will be equal citizens in this country. The sodomy laws have all fallen aside. Gay marriage is now a reality. From a historical perspective, it's a matter of minutes before this whole adoption thing is, is put to rest. Bye everyone, have a great day. But in the short term of history, where is this going? Will this be the test case in the Supreme Court? On one hand, I hope so because this is the right family, this is the right, this is the right circumstance, this is the right test to make. But on the other hand, I know that it's going to become a media circus. I know that the death threats are going to increase. I know that it's going to be another strain on this family. And for that, I'm very sad because it's, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be ugly. But I think Stephen and Roger have the have the wisdom and the courage, and I believe that they can fight this fight in a way that will be meaningful. So, I'm split. I'm as split as the 11th Circuit, but I suspect they will.
And Tracy, I'm serious. When you get to school, hang your jacket up and walk. Renike, try that palm towards your face so you see the inside of your palm. And it's a mirror seeing the most beautiful face in the world. Okay, and let's, 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 let's put the waters away for now, okay? Roger and Steve are helping me with some math, but the math that we learned this century, um, they didn't know back then. This oh. century? <laughs> Well, kids don't want to go lay down in bed and go to sleep. A kid wants to run around and play and have a good time and irritate somebody and agitate them. The, the other kids, they have a lot of important agitating to do. Hi. Hi. The table setting, and so can you okay? I got some earwax in my ear. I'm loving these. Loving these more cute. Having another one. <laughs> Ernie, almost done? I want to see you dance. Later on, Mom asked Wayne to do the worm. The worm? It's freaky. It's a dance they do laying on the floor. Kind of rides around the floor like a worm. It's hysterical. People do this? No, Wayne does it. <laughs> yeah, no, it is a dance. Rubber, 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 rubber